So thank you all so much for coming this evening. Um, as usual, um, <clears throat> the Locust Roundtables are open format discussions and topics in contemporary art, um, proposed and moderated by members of the art community in Miami and beyond. And um, like all of the formats, um, the, both the topics and the formats are experimental. So when Jackie, Jacqueline Paul Cohen was interested, um, we began the discussion of the uh, the Jacqueline Falcon Bed and Breakfast um, and her project there and um, some other ideas about uh, sort of context specificity and um, some other theoretical ideas surrounding uh, the, the correct place for art and happenings and ideas like that, we um, thought there was no better way to kind of broach the discussion but to also extend the bed and breakfast vibe into the round table and so please feel free to continue eating pancakes. Um, and thank you very much to our <laughs> Justin pancake assistant, Long. Justin Long. This is actually his solo exhibition for the B&B. Oh, it, oh yeah. okay, great. Well, um, <laughs> and then you may find that just before we get into it, circulating our two copies of Mi Wan Kwan's The Wrong Place, which is kind of what we wanted to hinge this discussion upon. Have it in here, too, if we want to pass it on. Oh, yeah, one. great. And then also this... Give them um, that one. Oh, right. Um, and then this book, From Studio to Situation, by Claire Doherty. So we can just pass it back and everyone can refer to find it for you. I can find it. Okay, so thank you so much, Jackie. And thanks for coming. Thank you. So we wanted to kind of start by looking at and kind of to, to look back at what um, Jacqueline's been doing with the Jacqueline Falcon Bed and Breakfast, <laughs> which uh, just as a very quick kind of idea, it, it, it starts... Um, it's very easy to think about it in the context of an apartment gallery um, or bedroom gallery, um, but really, it's it's really not like that at all because it's much more um, much more about, uh, for lack of a better term, a happening or a situation, um, and, um, and and and. The, so, so the artworks that are both commissioned and placed in the bedroom at, at a given time, they're exhibitions, but they're also um, sort of just the way, the status quo for that, for that place in that period of time. Um, and so we wanted to kind of run through, um, you know, some of, the, some of the things. And also feel free, no one, no one needs to stand. We have chairs, we have extra chairs, so. Um, oh yeah, there, thank you, Liz. There's more. Okay. Should, should I open this? Yeah. So just for some context, I wanted to kind of skate through some of the shows that Jackie has pulled together um, at the bed and breakfast. Yeah. So this first exhibition, which was called Marriage, Blood, and Adaptation, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> was actually how this conversation with Amanda and I started because she wrote an article for Art Slam. Yeah. Can everyone hear Jackie? Called the, it was called the, the Wrong Place Right at Home. Right. So it was also sort of based on this essay by Mi Wan Kwan, um, where she talks about this. And this one was really the most like literal one that's happened so far, because people made things like blankets, or which was Sinissa actually, this blanket here. Um, it looked a little bit more like objects that would be in a bedroom. Actually in a bedroom, like this embroidered yeah. quilt, for example. Sure, which is Sinisa Kukek who just walked in, I think. Um, there's a couple people in this room that were in the show, actually. So I'll just go through these a little bit. Um, this was Kevin Arrow. He did two projectors. One of them was all found family photos, and the other one was found either sunsets or sunrises, we're not really sure. Um, this was Ragnar Kertensen, it's a portrait of his daughter. And this is Misai Soto, who has been my roommate since I started this project. And he's a performance artist, so he's always sort of like using these exhibitions as an excuse to do something or like finding context for things that he's been thinking about. And he has an interesting relationship with his family, so he did a a piece for the first show where he, for the duration of the reception, he rearranged all the furniture in the room, <laughs> in the living room, um, because For he, hours. For like five or six hours. Right. And 
It was sort of to do with like Saturdays and Sundays. This is what he did with his mom and sister. And they would almost always sort of like land back where they started or close to it. But it was more about like doing it together, listening to music and moving things around and and this interaction between one another, like, oh, do you think this looks better here, here? Um, and then we left it how he sort of like ended for the duration of the exhibition, which was two months. And then there's always like this aspect of food and meal. So for that whole five or six hours, I also was sort of like stuck in one place. I think the stack of pancakes at the end was like this high or something. Like at a certain point, nobody was really eating them anymore, but I just kept making them. And then we had Oscar Bustillo uh, play music, and there was like a choir that was singing hymns. And then this is the second show that I did, which was after coming back from living in Iceland for a while, and I was sort of like stuck in this weird in-between state, living with friends who were here <laughs> for very cheap in a bedroom in their home. Thank you. <laughs> and I was confused and didn't know what I was going to do next, and I didn't have a new job yet, and I, I was going to go back to Iceland, so I didn't want to get stuck in anything, and I was just like really feeling very uncomfortable and in between, so that's sort of what the show was about. And I collaborated with an opera singer who I met working at a restaurant here in the design district, actually. I took this very disposable job because I knew I was going to leave again, and I didn't want to take anything serious in the the art world or anything so I was working at this restaurant and it's funny you like meet these people that are sort of like almost always in the same situation where they're like in between whatever they want to be doing and that's not what they're doing ever some of them end up in that for years but um, he's a great example of that like he's totally a career waiter but he's an opera singer like really classically trained and has an amazing voice but for the whole exhibition he was scrolling through uh, uh, Craigslist, like, job, he was looking at jobs on Craigslist the whole time and drinking tea in his robe while he was singing these really, like, classic Italian opera songs. So it's sort of about, like, what he should, should be doing because he's obviously an opera singer uh -huh. versus the fact that he needs a job to pay his bills. <laughs> So this was, was this more or less his everyday experience and you were Sort you of, I mean he to... had a job but he was sure. a waiter, Right. it's not what he wanted to be doing obviously. Um, but was... this wasn't necessarily like in your bedroom. No, this was right outside of the exactly. bedroom. So, so sometimes things bleed out, like with Misael, he was in the living room obviously. There's another image later of him doing something in the living room. Um, I like for the exhibition that's going to stay for the, the duration to be in the bedroom, but it's nice when there's sort of like other happenings that occur throughout the home, or not, but mm -hmm. if, they, if it makes more sense for something to be at a kitchen table than in my bedroom, then I'm open to it. Mm -hmm. The whole thing's very open. Um, again, there's always like some kind of food. This was a uh, work by Ricard Jean Quill. He did a... Uh, it's like a split wire light bulb, so you have to plug it into two outlets, but there's only one, uh, what do you call it, like the prong, I guess? Oh. Like there's how there's two prongs that go into the outlet, there's only one on each, so you have to plug it into two. Oh. And it stayed on the pillow. And then this was a show called Help You Help Me, and this was, it was about self-help publications, so I had Bookleggers, which is Nathaniel Sandler. He has a mobile library. He had like hundreds of self-help books. When I asked him, I thought he was just going to give me like a few. And he ended up giving me boxes and boxes of self-help books where I didn't even have like enough. There's a, there was a big bookshelf in the room and these little shelves. I ended up having so many that they were like under my bed, like raising my bed a little bit. And wow. all the artists were chose a self-help publication and they read it and made something at least like loosely based off of, of whatever they got out of it really most of it was pretty abstract like this is patty hernandez uh she has a project called spring break if any of you know that and she is sort of like a facilitator so she hasn't really made objects in a really long time and she was interested in sort of challenging herself to make an object as actually a exercise of self-help yeah um 
and like working with materials and what these materials mean to her and why she's using whatever the material is. So she she like got a studio and started working in a, a, like an artist studio, um, and she made this piece called "I Made a Sculpture," <laughs> and the lights part of it as well. Um, this is Joy Wang. She moved to LA, but she was Miami based for a very long time. Um, she is somebody who has all of these notes like all over her home and studio for real. Like I took these from her house. She didn't make them for the show. So she's somebody, she's the only person that I've ever met besides like moms who read these books and take them like really seriously. She, she reads all of them and she puts these little like affirmations all over her home and workspace and they definitely help her. I'm not sure that that would be helpful for me. In fact, this is the first exhibition that I did in this context where I realized sort of like how much these shows were affecting me, having to live in them for two months or however long it was. Or because but you actually have to experience them in a very... This one drove me crazy <laughs> because it's just in my nature to like pick up a book if it's near me and all the books in my room were self-help books. Which kind of like, I mean, before we open it really up, it, it opens up this, this thought about um, a lived experience, uh, like an authentically lived yeah. um, metaphorical, if you will, experience, yeah. um, as opposed to sort of visiting a context which you know is presenting, uh, <coughs> you know, a presentation of art. A museum you. or so, a gallery. Yeah, so this is a fundamentally different way sure. to experience uh, a place yeah. or an so for a minute I got kind of manic about like, oh my god, there's all these things that I need to change about myself or um, I don't think the right way or I need to lose weight or I have to find myself or work harder or trust myself and all this sort of bullshit because I'm fine, I think, for the most part. I, don't think, I mean, obviously there's things I have to work on, but not as much as I thought. So what I got out of it was sort of like how to decide when there's something you need to change because maybe there's like this thing that's not like totally right but you don't really have to work that you don't have to focus so much on mm -hmm. it um, but these books like tell you the complete opposite like fill your mind with all these things that are not right and you need to change them and mm -hmm. how to sort of um, this is from the same show this was by Christina Favretto she's the special collections manager of the University of Miami library and she wanted to do this timeline around my bedroom of my life. So she had a few photos, but she made most of it up. There was a few things where she would ask me like certain little moments in my life, but like this is a pic this is a picture of me when I was like a year or two old and she wrote one year says color and means it. <coughs> two years, one month decides she likes the smell of rain on asphalt. So she it was very poetic. Like there were certain points where like it was like runs for mayor of Reykjavik and wins, but it was like at 90 years old or something. <laughs> um, this was um, Christina, Christy Almeida. And then this is that same exhibition. This was Misael again. So he's, he pushes me a lot and he wanted to, we had just moved into this house. He took everything out of our living space besides the bedroom where the show was and put it all into his bedroom, including the refrigerator, the oven, everything. Um, so he was sort of like thinking about objects and how we have too much of them. And then there's little things that happen after the exhibitions. Oftentimes, like we did a yoga class with Catalina Jaramillo. And this is the last show that I did. It was called Bored Horny and it was with um, Christopher McDonald, who's primarily a photographer, but he's been branching out and doing these drawings and they're sort of about like this palpable boredom and and like internet porn basically and how it's not that it, they don't nobody really looks exciting in these images excited anymore in these images online because they're sort of like oversaturated with porn I guess okay <laughs> um, so they kind of plastered the room this is a interesting one to live in as well as you can imagine. This is the last one, I'm sorry. This is Catherine Marks. She made a, um, a carpet that she knitted when she was pregnant with her first child. Wow. And it takes up, it, it could have covered all the walls, including the ceiling, but we decided to just do it on the floor. Um, 
sort of created like a bit of a womb for the time. Hmm. Amazing. And then food again. This is a piece by Misael at General Practice, which is another similar, it's an alternative exhibition space that took place in a home. I'm sure most of you went to it when it was happening. It was Carlos Regal's space right over here. Um, Misael did a couple of pieces there as well. This was one where he had people sort of like join him in putting this puzzle together. It was a puzzle of the universe. Yeah, it was a puzzle of the universe. And then he it was also absolutely did absolutely impossible. Yeah, it was really hard. <laughs> kind of all looked the same no matter how hard you well, tried. Well, and it became about this this conversation about it and working with other people on sure. it and, and spending... Something you, know, you would do at home. You know? Yeah. Um, and then he also did this piece where he sang in the shower, but he had the iPod was... He uh, had his iPod outside of the shower, obviously, but people were, like, changing the songs on him and stuff. And he took a shower for, like, five hours. No, I think it was, like, three hours he was in the shower for singing. So there's been other people who have done similar things in Miami. General of Practice was sort of the first one that came to, that came mm -hmm. to mind, perhaps because it was the most recent. I think it just stopped operating a year. More first. inhabiting a space. Sure. Yeah. yeah. His, it was a bit different, though, because it was empty. Right. He didn't have, like, this. Home. He lived in it, but upstairs, and there was no, like, furniture downstairs or anything. It was pretty shabby and, right. like, more open to be more of a gallery type setting because you could do whatever you wanted with the space whereas in what I do there's like a there's obstacles it's a home practical obstacles of living sure yeah yeah there's I'm like I said I'm open people can change things around or we can talk about it yeah there's artists that like want to take everything out of my room well, and deal, besides the bed and right. like deal with it that way but um somewhere for me to sleep always needs to remain which is like the biggest <laughs> obstacle the closest I've ever got to being challenged by that is a show that I'm working on actually where they just like asked what would happen if we took the bed away and I said you can do that but leave something else for me to sleep on like right. besides the wood floor <laughs> even if it's like a yoga mat or something whatever but you have to deal with that obstacle mm -hmm. but it's pretty open otherwise well it's, it's interesting because the question is what does it mean to make uh, to make art um, happen in a place that's not you know, it's not that a home is not specifically for art. I mean, many, you know, a very conventional way of thinking about it is that in a home we're, you know, collect, where you might hang a painting or you might hang something that, sure. that you know, that ties the room together or something like that. Um, but that this is a fundamentally different way of, of thinking about, uh, about the production um, and the sort of experience of art, mm -hmm. um, and what it is to to make and present art in a in almost like a wrong context, um, because again, it's not this sort of picture hanging on the wall. I mean, in some instances, it is, but it's also about a much larger experience. It's funny because, like in this essay that we're basing a lot of this off of, it sort of says like anywhere outside of the studio is the wrong place. Mm -hmm. So then there's like that to think about, like we're always wrong, but she's also kind of goes into how like wrong doesn't necessarily mean wrong, and oftentimes that leads you on some other path that perhaps you should be on for the artist. Right, because who's to say that the right place for an artwork is necessarily in a gallery sure. or, you know, sometimes if you go to a collector's home and you find something in, in their home and it, you know, that, that artwork, it almost looks um, not out of place, but it, it you know, it, it, if it's about, you know, outside of the studio or if it's produced, if it's meant to be out in the world, you know, or if it was about something else sure. extraneous to, to well, there's the world. Also like, so, like it's neutered almost, it's caught yeah. and, and hung like a trophy in a there's way. There's also like this aspect which was in um, something else in this book, uh, which essay was it? I don't remember, but what the author basically said that like by producing for a stereotype, which in this case is a museum or a gallery, or you you can often, and maybe this is like de dependent on how easily influenced you are as an artist or swayed, but like oftentimes you're sort of going to end up fabricating a stereotype. Mm -hmm. Like you'll make one because you know it's going to end up being in the, in this white cube. Mm -hmm. um, so you might make something that's like what the right, market so then wants actually, or something. You're you know? actually making something that you think will look good in, in a way. Or sell. Yeah. 
Yeah, but not, I mean, that's not to say that that's not a place for artworks, but... No. Um, but like you said, with Kwan's ar argument, I mean, she, she almost goes around to saying maybe the wrong place for art, which would os ostensibly be outside of the museum or a gallery or a studio, may actually be the, the right place sure. for art. Yeah. Um, I think that, I don't know, she goes back and forth a lot in it too, because like in some parts you, you, you like believe that no work is like really what it should be in that context. And then in some parts she just kind of like goes back to saying, but like this is like the inevitable truth of the art world like this is where you want the work to be obviously well she's also talking about the sort of sense of place and right. the sort of itinerant mm -hmm. um nomadicism of the art world and right. how everyone's dashing around right well it talks a lot about how um like as a curator or a, or an art historian a curator type like your your status is sort of higher you're more well respected or well regarded or you get more work or you make it which inevitably leads to like fiscal Directly income, correlates like it's your, kind of about money and finances, sure, is um, based on how much you travel for your work. Like if you're this jet setter that um, that's all over the place for your work, then you're taken a bit more seriously, but then it sort of like goes into how like a sense of place remains remote to many of us and how like there's like this, um, I think she called it like existential homelessness as part of the human condition and how that's like sort of like what curators and art types suffer from now because mm -hmm. you're nobody if you're not a nomad if you don't have this sense of place which is like I'd like to be somewhere in the middle of all of that mm -hmm. I like having a sense of home and somewhere to feel that in. Yeah. Has anyone um, participated in or been you know visited the one of the exhibitions at the bed and breakfast oh and this is also to say that the bed and breakfast, another model for it, is actually to function as a true bed and breakfast. Eventually. Yeah. Eventually, so yeah. that's kind of another idea where it become, you know, engages in an economic model and sure. yeah. and actually become, you know, take takes this on in reality. And yeah. It always reminds me of the Superflex piece where they redid a bathroom, bathroom yeah. um, and, and the bathroom um, Chase Bank right? was an exact replica of the J.P. Morgan and Chase Bank, um, but it was above the Screasy Spoon Diner in, in, low, in yeah. the the lower uh, lower really Manhattan, cool. but it was. Um, but but you still have to use the bathroom and still went up and, and you you know so there's this a aspect of practicality which you know you have this lived experience that is you know really like nothing else um, sure but there's a weirdness there there's a weird you know yeah it has like the weird IKEA art in it <coughs> it looks like a bank bathroom but it's in a diner or just about, <laughs> about what kind of experience you're having and what place you're actually in you know, what kind of place you know. Um, because it's no longer sort of representative. Yeah. You know, the artwork is no longer representative. It's more about a lived, you know, a lived experience. Right. Does anyone have a, a, a thought about that? Do they agree or disagree? Or I think it's. Yeah. I mean, I think it's just about it being situational. Like we talked about this a lot too. Uh -huh. All of this is different from being in a gallery because it's situational. Like it takes on an actual situation that's sort of like real life like a real lived experience like what you're saying right well the situation you have to use the bathroom sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there's a phenomenology to it that is you know profound and you you have an experience and it is yeah. it is real and sometimes you're a little forced into it i guess like there's people in the diner who just have to go to the bathroom <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they weren't really the like, at the diner looking really. for it yeah well there's also like people coming in to see it because they know it's like part of this curated program. Sure. Art people. Yeah, art people going into <laughs> like the grungy diner to look oh. at the bathroom. Um, it makes me think a little bit of, you know, people like Alan Capra, who very famously said, you know, I, um, anything I do if I'm choosing to be an artist at this moment is, you know, I'm making art, so if I'm brushing my teeth, um, I'm, I'm making art, you know, I'm living this experience, and that's, you know, borders on being performative, but then also being very much the sort of uh, ch champion of happenings and understanding a uh, situation or a lived experience in terms of an artwork. Um, and this is also different than, um, than, a perform than performance art. 
you know, if we're going to talk about yeah. medium specificity. I think that a lot of performance artists are like drawn to what I do or what people like. Sure. Like, people that do things like but this. Mi Misael but crosses that line in this very strange way because yeah. even though it may or may not be a performance, you know, they're more the like furniture. interventions than performances, sure. I think. Yeah. Does anyone disagree or find it any more or less uh, authentic to perform something in a, in a space that's not necessarily meant for art, whether it's a domestic setting, a home, someone's bedroom, uh, a different kind of place? A site-specific, context-specific? I think it's, it, it, it uh, makes the person freer. Mm -hmm. The artist freer to, to do something unusual, something different, out of the box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where they're not just, okay, I'm tied to making yeah. this, this yeah. thing in my studio. Treating more, you know, the city as a studio or a much wider concept of where to... I think what's also good for artists in situations like this is that it doesn't really have to be like a complete thought yet. They can sort of like work on something in this context that and hash ideas out that can perhaps be in an institutionalized setting later, but it's a good incubator. Well, you know, the, there's the, the gallery, the wrong gallery, right? Which was yeah. <clears throat> um, this little gallery um, who, which was in, in New York City. Mm -hmm. Right, does anyone know about the Wrong Gallery and can speak to it with a better description? I've never <laughs> been, but. So um, it's Massimiliano Gioni, and um, there were like two other partners in it, and they decided that they would set up a gallery in a door frame mm -hmm. um, in uh, New York City. I think it was in Chelsea. In yeah. Chelsea, yeah. So, um, and then in this gallery, essentially, this little weird door frame. I mean, it functioned like a gallery, but it was also like this absurd, tiny little piece of real estate that was a tiny intervention into mm -hmm. the street. And then in terms of, like you said, institutional sort of absorption, mm -hmm. and now it's in Tate Modern. Yeah. And it's, again, it's like neutered. It's not in its, yeah. now it's in the wrong place it's in an art space. Out of context a little bit. Sure. But it doesn't mean that it's wrong. Yeah. Again. But doesn't that's, it? That, that's, that gives it another layer, which is interesting. I don't know if it's another layer. I think it's a different thing altogether. What do you think, Danny? I, 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 I think it's an evolution of the idea. It's you know, not wrong in this way. To but then know. that's to say that like the ideal is to be institutionalized, and maybe that's not what all the art, what every artist. I guess that that is what every artist to make wants. It into actually, I mean, let's be real. But sure. I don't. Maybe not. I don't know. When I was in school, I did. Uh, changing the way that somebody experiences a space. Very, but in a sense, like, Marilyn, you were also doing it <coughs> very context-specifically because you were like, all right, it's during finals. Right. What can I do in this particular situation that's going to, you know, work with this? Yeah, it became <coughs> something um, useful. It wasn't just mm -hmm. a display. Yeah, there's something. context. Like, I was trying to keep right. Mm -hmm. But say if it were to happen somewhere else, it wouldn't have the same it wouldn't have an authenticity. Yeah. Like I, I had this like a similar video put in a museum. Like a front like during my BFA show. I had tried meditation in a museum and people would go and just kind of hit them and do it there, but it did feel great. And it was mm -hmm. also something that was to be done with many people. So Amongst chaos. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was interesting having um, this video put in different places. Mm -hmm. I think like a lot of this has to do with the fact that you can like sometimes drop your usual motive and like draw from or be drawn from the terrain. So a lot of times like an artist will come into the bedroom for example and they 
draw from it, obviously, because it's a bedroom. Like it's so, it's so, so many things about it are so obvious in what I do. Like this is a bedroom. It could, what I, as an artist, the subject that I deal with or whatever can be very personal if I want it to be, and it will be in context. It won't because it's not like a cold space. It's warm. Mm-hmm. It, they're sort of like drawn to being more personal or warm about it and mm-hmm. but then there's also this other aspect of like they're drawing from it but it's drawn from them as well because the space is affected by whatever they do mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. and the space changes well it becomes very it's a very personal space right it's and intimate yeah. yeah yeah it's not like you know i guess uh what is it about it was the the um you know the white just a man, sort of manifesto of a white cube, or understanding what a white cube is, or an art space, um, you know, and, and recognizing that that has its own context specificity as well, and it comes with its own baggage. And, and yeah, I mean, like we're fine in that context because we're around it so much, but there's people that are very uncomfortable in that, like even yeah, well, you know, like my mom wants to come to all the things that I do, but she's mm-hmm. not necessarily comfortable in those situations. Sure. I've had people that like other that friends have brought to the receptions or happenings that go on in the B&B and I don't know them which is always nice because it's usually like the same people which is fine but it's cool when new people come in obviously they don't usually have anything to do with the arts but they're interested like they're mm-hmm. genuinely engaged in the situation mm-hmm. and a lot of them have vocalized the fact that they're intimidated by the white cube to me and that this is this is like they're they they're happy to be looking at art right now, but they don't love going to galleries because of intim- they yeah. use the word intimidate. Well, the white cube, it's, it's really, it's a, I mean, um, it's about neutrality. It's cold. But it's also about, you know, uh, presenting something in a context With that space is neutral. And, yeah. Nothing can affect the work. It's just about the work, which is important, obviously. Like that, that format is important. We need mm-hmm. it. So, I mean, when you do something in your bedroom, that neutrality is no longer available. No, it's about the bedroom always, no matter what you're gonna do, it's still in that context of the bedroom. Yeah. It's never gonna go away. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's problematic to a degree, like it's, it's I mean, it, not, not in terms of, um, not in terms of artistic merit or anything like that, but it's, it's hard to, I, I'm so fascinated with this project because it's hard to understand what it really is. It's hard to understand what the medium specifies. For me to understand is, you know, Coming from an art too. historical sort of perspective. Yeah. No, it's confusing. <laughs> I mean, I get confused all the time. I don't, like, <laughs> I don't ever like know what my place is. And right, but obviously it's interesting. You know, art world or whatever. You know? Yeah. But I think that's why, like, any of my friends that I've talked to about doing projects are excited about it, because it's this, like, there is this challenge about it that excites them, which is almost always bed, honestly. Like, it's about bed. That's really? the obstacle, is that, like, if, as an op- as a spatial object, it's the bed that's the obstacle. Well, and then also, if you were to actually... Because it's the only thing that has to stay there. Mm-hmm. I sleep in there. And if you were to, you know, uh, you know use it as a true bed and breakfast... Mm-hmm. You're also dealing with this sort of customer relationship where you're having people you stay in your, in your own bedroom and experience yeah. the artwork, but not necessarily like, oh, this is this art, you know, this is this thing on the wall. Yeah, I have people come to see the shows after the opening a lot. Uh-huh. Like they make like an appointment to come see it, and uh-huh. it's always like weird and fun to like open yeah. my apartment door and let them in and walk them into my bedroom and. Yeah, there's an like let them in. I guess it's weird. It's strange. It's a little bit uncomfortable in this cool way. Yeah. But then there's, so like, I've been trying to get people to stay in the bedroom since I started doing <laughs> this, but I don't throw it out there to. I don't want to like. Well, if anyone over, wants to book a weekend, I don't overdo it. Just... Like it's the the initial idea was supposed to be like people would stay a night. I think I, I made it cost money so that it would be genuine. It wasn't really about like me making money. It was about like me being able to feed them or something. Like they get a meal. Uh-huh. Um, I think the format was supposed to be like you get breakfast. You check yeah. in in the evening. Maybe something will happen, <laughs> like some kind of activation. or uh-huh. And then in the morning, one of the artists or something will come have breakfast for you or make breakfast for you. But then you check out. Um, and nobody ever took it seriously, so I still haven't had one person stay the night, like, ever. None. And so one of the shows that I'm working on, with Sinisa actually, is he's, like, really, they're pushing it. Like, they really want people to stay, so we're working with that idea a lot. 
Cool. That's like the idea. Yeah, for all you taste makers, taste makers out there, look out for the golden letter. <laughs> <laughs> the golden letter. Nice. Right. So this is gonna get me into trouble. Yeah. I might lose my job. I wish it was your real job. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but then there's also that strange thing where if you if you're doing the, the bedroom, you know, the bed and breakfast, you're you don't have you're displaced. I'm displaced. <laughs> I'm the couch. <laughs> <laughs> or like Misael always like agreed to let me sleep in his bedroom if it happened. He I happen to live with my best friend, so all this works and he's an artist, so he he gets excited about these things and he wants it to happen how it should happen and he pushes it as well and this is so different it's than easy, like this. You know? We have an interesting history, I think, particularly in Miami of apartment galleries. And, and sure. There's been a lot of really serious commercial galleries that started in apartments. Absolutely. Sarah yeah. Godlock I was, yeah. started in an apartment. Um, mm-hmm. Brooke Dorsch. Brooke Dorsch started Dorsch? In, his no. apor- in, a, in his apartment. Yeah. Um, I mean, our director at the museum had an apartment gallery, Alex huh. Bertenfeld, in New York for a long time. Right. But all of these people did it because they couldn't afford or weren't ready for their commercial gallery yet. Right, so they were actually, okay, there, this was a stepping stone, but there's also sure. this, this I have. I aspect. should say, I have absolutely no desire to ever, ever, ever have a commercial gallery. I've worked for plenty. Uh-huh. I don't frown upon that model. I could continue to work with for right. them, so but the, it's just, like, not for so me to own a gallery. So the things aren't actually necessarily for sale that you have. They are, but they I'm are. not, like, pushing that agenda by any means. I talk to the artists about how much things will cost in case it comes up so I know what mm-hmm. to say. I mean, I deal with it the same way that a gallerist would in the mm-hmm. sense that... Or actually, I don't do fifty-fifty. I do. They get more, mm-hmm. so it's a little bit. Well, different, just but just like how an apartment gallery. I mean, many of them have had, you know, hum, you know, humble origins, but have have of course become successful, and, and maybe that's in part due to you know their curatorial um, eye, but also to the fact that it, there's a there's not like this pressure. There's an intimacy yeah. in having someone into your home and showing them work, and that that is um, that's different than. Any other? I've made know, a couple of sales in this asset. project, and whenever it happens, I'm like, really? You want to know how much? Like, I'm like shocked. And I was not expecting somebody sure. to ask for the price. I forget usually, and like look on my sure. computer, or it's just like it's awesome when it but happens. It's obviously, than going but it's to like a, not a cafe or something, and, and seeing seeing art up on the wall. Yeah, because in the cafe, you know. there's like a label underneath it with the price. <laughs> and but there's a lot of different things happening here. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, there's a lot. Of, there's there's issues about. Um, the commercial aspect of the work and the yeah. non-commercial and the performative. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact of the matter is all these artists are trying to make a living. Obviously, I want to help them if I can, but they come into it knowing that that's like not part of my agenda, really. It's sure. cool to make a buck on both sides. Sure. Like, It's awesome if both of us make money because somebody wants to buy a work. And we talk, like I said, we talk about it before. We make a price list that I put on my computer, but it's not like printed out on my <laughs> desk or something. Like, it's not like on the platter on the night, night table or anything. No, I mean... It, you should, if you're dealing with an artist, you, you're like at least vaguely responsible for some small part of their career, uh-huh. and you should take that into consideration and respect that. And they they worked to make whatever they made for this situation, mm-hmm. and yeah, a lot of times it's like just like not something that would be for sale anyway. Mm-hmm. But there's also like drawings and sculptures and paintings sometimes, and sometimes somebody might walk in and but find and them beautiful and want to buy it. To be to think context specifically, like those things would be in a bedroom. Also, anyway, some of them. I mean, I don't know that it. somebody would have that like tarp <laughs> sculpture with a dog leash tied right. around it in their bedroom. But then, of course, but if, you're, if we're going to think again, like site specifically, context specifically, of course, it does make sense for a, be- a bedroom to be to be decorated, you know, with art. Yeah, but I think there's a lot of things that artists choose to put in my bedroom that is not like the first thing that a co- like I said, I've worked for commercial galleries before. People want mostly paintings or you know like smaller sculptures or unless they're like mega collectors that have tons of storage units or whatever and they want to buy because they are interested in the artist's career or whatever else or think that it's going to you know we can get into market bullshit but I don't want to. I just am more interested in that idea of context but did you have a a comment Dave? Are you just are you just? Well I have a question. Okay. So when you do these things it's usually like a one person uh, no, actually, the first, the first two were group exhibitions. I'm trying to do mostly solos now, just because I think it's better for the artists to like really consider the space on their own, come as much as they want, and talk to me about it. Um, 
most all the shows that I have set up the next year are all solos besides like one but it's a collective it's two people that make work together as you know it's one work um I think it makes more sense I think maybe I should do like one group show a year or something and maybe it, it just makes more sense for them to be solos because of the intimacy maybe I don't know or just like it's harder for me to get a bunch of artists together and talk about the space together and I think that like it should be cohesive obviously so I think I think I could add to that a little bit in terms of why asking about the show. Um, Can you talk about it? Just 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 kind of having experience just working with you, kind of prepping in the last couple of months for whatever the show's gonna happen. And notice that um that you 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 become kind of collaborators, so um, I think you also kind of wear the the uh, the hat of the artist as well. Um so I think I mean, I'm not entirely sure how your other experiences uh, working with others are, but I imagine that, that there's probably a lot of dialogue and conversation yeah. prior to, to, to the, the action. So I think if there was more than like one or two others, mm -hmm. I'm not so sure if you It would get oversaturated. Like that. that I wouldn't like that? No, I don't know. I like to be I like to be intimate and I like to collaborate. I mean, your situation was special, obviously, because there was a third collaborator in your group who is no more, and I became the third in that situation. But yeah, that certainly happens. But and, and yeah, in the group exhibitions, they're harder. But the only time when that happened in a group exhibition for the show was the self help one. But I think it was more because I became a little bit manic because of it because of these publications all around me um you know i was thinking about the same things that the artists in the show were but it was a big handful of artists in my in one bedroom to be working with so it was tougher i mean i think i definitely enjoy doing these smaller shows or with one or two artists for the for yeah, that I mean, reason you yeah. want to have 12 people in your bedroom would you well, I mean, you've been to the openings. There's like a hundred people in yeah, the bedroom sometimes. Kind of view, I mean, sure. You mean to live with and actually. go to sleep with every night? Pardon me? You mean to live with and sleep with and... I don't know. I'm just trying to... What's the other thing you know about? I miss the intimate space, bedroom, you know, why there? I mean, I missed the beginning. I do apologize. I wasn't there. I don't know if that was talking about. Um, Amanda and I have talked about this a lot, though. I mean, we touched on it a little bit here, but I think it's really just like the bottom line is that I... Um, a lot of these like apartment galleries are a stepping stone, like we just sort of discussed, and that's like not my intent. I don't ever want a commercial gallery, so the bedroom is more specific. It, it gives me more context to work with. It's more intimate. I really like when people can get close to something, and um, I like this aspect of having to live with it for two months or however long it is. Something that I've been thinking about a lot is how to like document how it affects me, but I don't want it to be like this cheesy blog or journal or something. So I've been thinking about like brainstorming a little bit how I, I think it's important that I start sort of there's some kind of documentation that goes with how it affects me or or a boyfriend or whatever like whoever's living with. But the context of domesticity too. Sure. Um, and like what you just said is interesting because it's not so much about um, personal, but it, as it is domestic. Right. You know, like this is not Jackie's project about her Jackie. everyday life. You know, no. it's really to the contrary. It's you. But my everyday life lives within it. So. Sure. Yeah. So there, there's aspects of neutrality, but but there, but but the the sort of uh, the sort of uh, objective um, aspect is the fact that it is in a domestic setting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean. I feel like the bathroom brings like another layer to it that is very different than any other room in the house, right? But because even if you have friends over, you would usually not bring them into the bathroom. Right, it's more, more like intimate than room. say the living room is. Yeah, so the bathroom, like you said, you said in, in intimacy, right, or privacy, and I think the, the bathroom has also other themes like sexuality or. or mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's like something that almost every artist I work with brings up, obviously. It's, yeah. it's obvious. You know. <laughs> Sex. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> and it also it reminds me of, um, like I visited Catherine Mike's house, mm -hmm. and then um, Eddie was, was telling me to go into the bathroom to look at the art, right? And I was like, what? I'm not going to go into the bathroom. Yeah, Catherine and I have talked about this before. Yeah. So it's, it's really like, I, I think 
what what the specificity of, of this project is. It's a lot about this almost like like an invisible wall or like a social wall that is built up. Mm. Uh, well, there's like it's a lot about like blurring the, the blurring, the blurring privacy and yeah. and uh, yeah. public and private. I guess. Yeah. Did you have a comment there? Yeah, I also wanted to add that we came to have a lot of um, Marcel Duchamp saying to be the wrong thing in the right place mm -hmm. and the right thing in the wrong place. Sure. And I think you nailed it really well mm -hmm. by saying it better than the gallery. And at the same time, you're blurring the links between the gallery and art yourself because you're becoming a performer in your gallery. This is something that comes up a lot, especially with Misael. We talk about, and Amanda and I talked about this a little bit in this, in when we talked about um, owning a real bed and breakfast one day. So, like, the idea is for this to be a real functioning business one day, but under the realm of like, you know, a bigger home where you would, what a real B and B would be like when you go to one. There's several bedrooms and. Um, I'd be doing the same thing, but at maybe like a slightly larger scale, or not necessarily like the, the shows would remain the same, but there would be like other programming around it, maybe more happenings that go on, or more of a place for people to just like come and work on things yeah, or whatever. But yeah, it's kind of different than like a nice bed and breakfast with a great collection. It would probably you know? be mostly art people that come and stay because that's who would know about it, but maybe not. Um, but what what I was gonna touch on with that is that. Um, like now, I'm. It is. There is this like sense that I'm a bit of a performance artist in it. And also touching on what Sinessa said a little bit. But once, uh, Misael and I talk a lot about how when it's a real business, when I have a real, whether it's in five or ten years or next year, whenever it is, like that whole thing is going to change a lot mm -hmm. because I'm not really going to be performing anymore. I'm now going to be this business owner. Mm -hmm. I'm not pretending to be a B and B owner. I will be. Right, which really, tr which really troubles, um, troubles the equation. But it also, uh, I actually, I don't think it troubles it because it makes it. I think it actually makes it more, um, more of an interesting sort of art. Project. I think that the context, besides the because fact that I'm not a performance artist anymore, is the same. Like it's mm -hmm. still in a room that you sleep in. Maybe it's not my room mm -hmm. anymore. That's the only difference. It's a guest's room. Mm -hmm. But then more people get to experience it rather than just me every night. Yeah, well, and, but and also the fact that it is a real B and B. Right. I mean, that that's kind of the part of it that's that's really um, really interesting. You know, it it, it functions. Right. Yeah, I think you know there's an interesting aspect that when we maybe perhaps when we visit a museum or a gallery, we're very aware that we're visiting a space for art. We're aware that we're going to be encountering mm -hmm. things that are out of the ordinary, perhaps, or you know, we're prepared for that kind of experience. Yeah. Um, but then but you can very slip very easily from into into just a, in, you know, what is life, what is art kind of sure. um, blurring. I, I look really forward to when it's a real functioning business because a lot of artists that I work with think so much about, like, oh, how weird would it be if this, like, sound thing turns on? Sure. Or, you know, like, Cara Despain is an artist that I'm working with for the next year and she wants to, like, project on the blanket or, you know, like, things that would really be an experience for people. And it's, like, sort of a shame that just, like, my boyfriend and my dog and I get to experience it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or whoever decides to come visit, you know. Are those Lori Anderson pillows that you put your head on and they, she speaks to you? Yeah. Or are they, they, what do they do? They make I think they sing or something. Or sing? Yeah. <laughs> like a lollipop. Yeah. Is the idea that if, why you do do the pillow and the that the artist, part of the idea is that they do something that is interactive? Or is that not necessarily? Does not that necessarily, but it, it's certainly open to that. I mean, I think that artists are tempted by it already just with me. Like, they, they like, want to fuck me up. You yeah. know, like, they want to do things that are going to, like, <laughs> drive me crazy. You know, they're like, you have to live with this for two months. You're doing this to yourself. What can I do to, like, throw you off, you know? <laughs> and really, I mean, it, okay. saying that it's reminding me. Imagine how excited artists would get if somebody different is going to yeah. be in it every night. Yeah, exactly. So that we would feel like it's a different schedule. He's saying that this reminds me that a lot of us have worked in like so many different spaces throughout Miami. And when you're working at a gallery or a private collection, whatever it may be, that has an exhibition that has sound, mm -hmm. and it kind of drives me insane. Oh, when you work at the desk, when yeah. You work the works. There's this you know, piece that has sound. Same thing over and over again. Whatever, it's we've all experienced My worst that, experience yeah. with this was when I was an intern for Gallery Diet when I first moved <laughs> to Miami <laughs> about six years ago. And she had this five years ago, maybe, whenever it was. She had this piece, 
in the show where these dogs were having sex and it was like the most horrific sound. It kind of sounded like the female dog was getting raped. Like she didn't really, she was yelping. It was like the screeching yelp. It was awful. And it was so close to the front desk and it was so loud. And for like five hours a day, for four days a week, I had to listen to that. And I just like never wanted to go to work because of it. So yeah, I have to live in stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. But I could turn it off, you know. <laughs> I think there's something really interesting. Um, like I keep on hearing, maybe because it's still not a bed and breakfast, mm-hmm. like that's operating, but I keep on hearing like this hesitation of becoming it open, like turning it open to a larger public, like I don't know, you being Airbnb. I, I had the first show on, actually I think it still is an Airbnb, I get requests sometimes, but it's always between exhibitions and it's like stupid for me to take it in yeah, that like case. I feel, but I, I feel that, that hesitation even like relates to a gallery context in the sense that a gallery is supposedly open to like the public and Yeah, sometimes I've had some like strange emails for like so and so told me about something you're doing, I'd like to come by, or somebody stumbles upon the website. And I've had some randoms come in where they make appointments. I mean, it is technically open to the public, but because it's my house and I have a day job and I'm not there all the time, you have to make an appointment. I don't have like open hours or anything. Well, it's interesting too, like as opposed to, um, you know, a gallery sort of advertising itself or an art institution advertising. itself in this sort of norm, normative channels for uh, an art experience, your, your sort of advertising stream is Airbnb or um, something like that. And it's kind of the same yeah. sort of alternative format as, you know, a, a critical art review on Yelp. Yeah, I read something the other day that I couldn't find after I saw it, which was frustrating. I have to look harder where I think Airbnb has like a section now for art stuff. That is so strange. That's so interesting. I gotta look it up later, but I remember reading like some snippet in an article saying like there's this you can there's like a listing of people who do like put I don't put make some kind of art experience in the room and it's very strange. Yeah. So there's people looking for it, I guess. If it's there, right? Early in your presentation, you talked about having this disposable job at the restaurant. You we weren't sure if you were going to go back to Iceland yet. And like a, with a lot of artists in Miami that I speak to, there's kind of a shared sentiment that people want to leave. Yeah. And among some of them. And I'm just wondering how much uh, did like your role and doing the DMV and working with other artists and probably like growing your sense of community here in Miami, did that help sway your decision? I did go back. Oh, you did go yeah. back, but not stay. Um, yeah, but I knew that unless I got married, I couldn't stay. So um, I went for another three months, and then I came back. I just knew that I was going to leave again for three months. So I, I mean, I think that we all go through these like phases of, you know, like, I am sucks, whatever, but I think that's anywhere. You know, you get like sort of oversaturated with all the same shit all the time. But I mean, honestly, even in New York, that could happen anywhere it can you're still always going to be in your bubble no matter where you are I don't have time to go out of my bubble you know like I remember like you brought the bubble home yeah it's like so that's like an issue that I have actually is that I like hate compartmentalizing I like for everything to be in this one place so I have like this really silly fantasy of like the B&B being where everything is like this is my job this is where I go to sleep this is where like my husband and kids are frolicking around it's where my dogs are like it's where my office is, it's where, you know, maybe that means I have to take more vacations or something, but mm. I love the idea of everything being in one place. And I don't know, I don't know if that question was like leading to whether I should be here or not, or if I want to leave here. I don't know, or if the B&B is going to be here or not, I have no idea. Like, I don't know, and there's like um, this, this thing that I think about a lot, which is like an, a bed and breakfast in Miami is like so out of context like mm. either it would do really well because there's there there's not really like this bed and breakfast model here and people might find it sweet or something or it will just totally like flop because people come and they want like south beach high-rise hotels on the beach you know like it could go either way so i don't know i don't know if it will end up here or where other b and b's are you know i'm not sure 
Is there an aspect of being a host that you find interesting? Yeah, but that's like um, maybe just like part of my programming, if anything. You know, I come from like this New Yorker Italian family where they there's food and people make sure you're okay all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it's just in my nature. So that's part of it then, right? Yeah, one. totally. Well, hospitality. I mean, you're interested yeah. also like in hospitality. Yeah, yeah. Like and what it means to like make somebody comfortable or um, make sure they're fed or whatever. Like all these very like basic yeah. human needs kind of. Do you find that that relates in any way to feminism? Or uh, discourses okay. around feminism? <laughs> <laughs> okay, where is Liz? Can I read something to you? Because <laughs> you made me think about this, and I wasn't before you, you came that day. Liz came like two weeks ago or something, and she sort of like asked me this, and then I went on like this like weird, like I think it's in this notebook actually somewhere maybe well and, and this only comes to bear because you know um there's some um what can we say some sort of iconography icons that you present so when you're cooking in your kitchen you well it's like apron, it's like feminine ideas and trappings kind of sure. that we've been sort of like you know the housewife aesthetic and giving care to people and what it means to give sure. care to somebody and to be care to be caring and there's like female. i think it's also a lot about the aesthetic though like sure. you talk about the really it's also about right and i think right um and domesticity and what it means thinking about right i think that that could be problematic if you're like being forced into it and you don't and you don't like uh -huh. fight that a little bit but in this case it's sort of like like i'm utilizing it in a way mm -hmm. in, by in like a like as a means for almost like being in control, really. Yeah, like so, I mean, the ultimate control. Sure. And, and like, what are we in of fourth, the space. Fourth wave feminism these days? Right, or? like, so it's, it's, for me, it's like, I, one, this is just like a way of being that's natural to me because of my family or um, like I enjoy to cook and, and like make a home or whatever. Um, I like that. Um, but I think it's also about having control of the space itself and, and sort of like, a, like acting in the spirit of women in my family or um, like giving care is this role that was created with you know undue pressure for mm -hmm. for women do you think this impacts the way that the artists are experiencing their position in the i think that they know the they're going to be taken care of <laughs> but i think that that should be like a feeling even in a cold gallery that exists like you should feel uh -huh. like you're going to be taken care of it doesn't mean that your gallerist is going to make you pancakes but it means that <laughs> but ho good hopefully you feel comfortable with them sure. you know um i i think uh you know, there's like this pressure for women that maybe I'm like dis displaying it in a problematic way in some points, but it, it's sort of like this like pressure for women can sometimes like give them a place for like power and autonomy in a way. Like, because like you can think about the kitchen in this case. The kitchen is like this place where historically we were shoved to be, obviously, but. Um, like sort of where we talk all our shit and um, I don't know we passed on our legacies in the kitchen for women there's like this other way that you can look at it where like we've got something out of uh -huh. it you know it's we're empowered. forced into the situation but we're, we're empowered because of it because think of all these stories that we know because our mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers or aunts and stuff were in the kitchen talking and passing their legacies on. And Does anyone remember the performance artist from the 70s? It's a woman, and she's she, it's called In the Kitchen, and she's taking kitchen items and spoons and knives and just throwing them. Okay. It's a black and white film. No. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? I'll have to find it. I guess, like, the, you know, the issue that needs to either be dealt with or, like, or that I need to decide is not an issue at all is whether I'm like internalizing this male gaze by like wearing an apron or something, well, you know, like, like is that, is man, that, yeah. who cares? But it's also, it's I mean, just you're not really so much, you're not interested in labor the way that like Mira Latterman um, Euclid is when she was, um, you know, uh, 
mopping the sidewalks and the steps. No. Um, it's not It's not so much about labor for you. It, no, I have control of the space yeah. because of these things. Like, nobody else does. I don't need you anybody need to sure. help me in this case, you know? It's the, like, I'm the head of the household or whatever. I'm not shoved into the situation. I just went there on my own, you know? But for, I think in this context, it's a lot about, you know, family. I think about my family a lot. Mm -hmm. They're Italian. They cook. They're in most people's families talk in the kitchen, you know? Mm -hmm. That's where it happens. That's where it all happens. It strikes me that a lot of what you're talking about right now kind of wouldn't be an issue if it were a business. So kind of like, it's, like you're talking about what you're doing now, and then you're talking about things you're expanding into a business. Mm -hmm. And it, it would really be a totally different thing. I've thought a lot about it being a nonprofit, maybe at first, and then figuring out if it should be this a business or not. Um, but either way, it's going to be the same amount of work. I'd be doing the same thing no matter what I'm filed under, you know. Right. But people will look at it differently. Well, like, oh, you're an art nonprofit that people can pay to stay in, rather than this like hotel, basically, you know, bed and breakfast, whatever. It changes the context just by how you're filed. Yeah. And it sounds silly, but mm -hmm. it's like whether you're for profit or not. Sure. Yeah, but fundamentally it keeps going back to the point that this is a real functioning business. Either way that, it is, yeah. Yeah, and that, that allows it to, to go into another zone that's very, that's very interesting. Yeah. So how do you select your artists? They're usually friends. Can't lie about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> it makes sense, right? It's an intimate space, and I don't really want strangers in my bed. Um, but I, when I first started the project, I remember thinking, like, how cool is this going to be for me socially? I'm going to run out of artists soon, and I'm going to have to, like, be more social and meet new people and artists and, and ask people to introduce me to more artists and talk with them. And, you know, our bubble's small. It's going to run out. Maybe I might run out of artists here that I want to work with. Does anyone have any questions or ideas about like happenings and what that really is? Historically. Do you mean historically? Historically and like, is it relevant? Is our happenings relevant today? I mean, I think in the 60s there was an aspect of, you know, the dematerialization of the art object and interest in moving away from object-based art. Um, that's sort of not really our agenda today. And so perhaps like the sort of the political um, will or spark behind that movement is it's just not present. I think it is. It's a dinosaur. I don't think it's a dinosaur. I think that a lot of artists experience things. Perhaps people are experiential beings. But I don't think a happening is always just an the same thing as being an experience. It's broader, right? Right. That's why yeah. I said. That's why I said historically because I think it's changed. Exactly. Over time. I mean, she she does not think it's changed. She thinks it's like it's limited. And it's in that period of time, and it's not like. Do you want me to get that? I'm not being paid. Yeah, go grab it. Go grab it. Of course, because there. I mean, there. Like she said, I mean, there. There's this historical moment, this precedent for this in the fifties um, and sixties. In the fifties and sixties, yeah. for this thing, the situational, the, the Capro days, and, yeah. and the situation was international yeah. in the nineteen fifties and in Paris. And mm -hmm. but they had very different motives. I mean, they were interested. In, it was more about like theory and. Well, it was about politics. It was yeah. about power. It was about power struggles. It was about. Um, you know, anti-capitalism. It, it was didn't about start as an art movement, but there were artists that were part of that movement and made work based on it. I think many people were artists. Yeah. But a lot of them were, um, like, not politics, but uh, writers or many thinkers. They were all thinkers. Activists. Yeah. Activists and thinkers. Yeah, um, but, mostly uh, activists. But of course it was about... You know, the situation is international is about moving through spaces, moving through the city, um, yeah. you know, in a way that wasn't, uh, that isn't structured. So it's not about let me get up and go to work today and then walk down the street and then get into my car and then go drive there. And, you know, it was yeah. a different, it was about what would I do if I just, if it, if, if I phenomenologically was inclined to move over there. Right. <laughs> and, and then what, what would happen if I lived my whole life like that, or, you know. Right. Um, but it had an overt 
political mm -hmm. over. It was very specific. That was very specific yeah. to the revolution. I mean, there's a lot of writing that came out of it. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. But this is this is like we're in different times, you know. Yeah. And you know, are we still in it? We're not. We're not. Um, we're not concerned with these concerns. The artists of this generation. You know, we're just talking about the situation that's international Small and subject. other things like that. But what what you got? Entirely disagree with Rosalind Krauss. I'm sure she'd be happy to have an argument. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd rather she, not she, have an argument with Krauss. <laughs> But that's really broad, so there's no reason why most. She goes on the Yeah. Well, I mean. I know, but I'm... under that umbrella, it's like uh, yeah. most of the things that our friends around that are saying they're orchestrating these happenings, yeah. like it falls well, under that's, that. Well, that's, you know, getting into this book, that's what's really interesting is like thinking about the extended notion of happening mm -hmm. and how that relates to artistic practices of today, which are context specific, site specific, situation specific. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you know you're making art but you're no longer making art in your studio? What does that mean? You know, this is a dramatic and this isn't like the first time we're having this idea. No, <laughs> you know, but but this is a this is really it's thinking about a practice. Mm -hmm. It's thinking about an artistic practice that's much you know I think you guys said it's blurring the lines between art and life and health. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, relational aesthetics and all these other things that are packed in, you know, baked into the cake um, as an evolution, you know, from these Caprao 50s, 60s uh, happenings, if you will. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and this is to say that this is, uh, I mean, this is a practice of contemporary art that we can, that art historians can talk about just as easily as Rosalind Kress could talk about happenings from the 50s and 60s. It's just that it's, it's a wider yeah. conception of things. I think a lot of performance artists now have, like, an issue with the term performance art, and they jump to Situation saying that or it's situational or... Yeah. Um, a happening. Yeah. Like they use the word happening they, a lot. And perhaps it's like making a comeback in a strange way. Because ha happening yeah. or situation is really the only medium that's like, it's using time, it's and using space, space, time and space it's using yeah. place. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a you know very complex. Uh, and it's also uh, a Daniel lived experience. Daniel Byrne in that book like, talks about this like ever-expanding gap between like works and their place. Uh-huh. Which is similar. I mean, Yes, yeah. and it's not just about like oh I'm having a weird theatrical phenomenological experience with this Robert Morris sculpture on the floor like it's it's a it's about oh I was I'm at the border of um, Mexico and California and I'm watching someone being shot out of a rocket because Great. which is actually a real piece yeah I know so I can't remember but but of, of something that is happening that is uh, has very much to do with where the place that it is mm -hmm. taking place. So you think there's less work like that? I think there's it, tons yeah. of work like that. Not that there's less. Yeah, it, I think there's it's, a lot. But the, the interesting thing about it is the the way by which it comes about, um, and 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 how people and, and access to it, I think, is huge. Access and well, it's still within the bubble that we keep going back to. Sure. For the most part, like if you know, then you know, and then you see it, mm -hmm. or if you happen to be there or whatever. Mm -hmm. but it's usually whether it happens in the context of an institution or out of it. Sure. Like Joseph Boy's, you know, in the Seven Thousand Oaks, putting you know these granite Seven Thousand pieces of granite throughout, you know, cities mm -hmm. and people encountering them, burying them, and working with here together, and um, yeah, that was a very cool piece. Sure. Well, wouldn't you consider the process slash documentation of the art in the bedroom to happen? I mean, documentation, if you said there two months? The documentation of the... Story. Actually, don't document it. Other people do. Which oh, is like, like why the images Snapchat are so or? bad okay. on my presentation, because I've never... I just go online after the opening receptions and steal everybody's photos. Which, like, for a while, I was like, oh, this is fun. It's, like, accidentally interactive, and they're participating and don't even know it, and I'm stealing their images. And But now it's a little problematic. 
now that people are taking me seriously, asking me to do talks, and I have to show them pictures. Oh, just, <laughs> just a round table. Just. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm going to keep doing that, though. Okay. I like well, it. Well, we have five minutes left, but I think that we should just have pancakes and, and enjoy it. So thank you so much.